A tremendous outrush of colonization had thrown nuclei of Greeks organized in city-states widely over the shores of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. Now remember there was a, a hot technological boom. There was just a few individuals in just one generation. And then after that, it just got more and more serious. That was around the year 700 BC. Now it says Greece basically had people all over the Mediterranean and therefore, quote, every pressure or intrusion from outside affected in some degree the whole of the Greek world. And then we have a quote from Dio Christosom from Orations. Dio, C-H-R-Y-S-O-S-T-O-M. Uh, quote, Greece lies scattered in many regions. Very true. So Greece wasn't just this area of Sparta and Athens. Greater Greece. In, internally, the Greek homeland had largely crystallized into city-states, first in the more developed regions, and then by imitation or in self-defense in the neighboring districts. The polis forced nearby people to go into the polis. The Greeks, however, who lived along the northern and western edge of Greece proper still remained on a tribal basis. Uh, as we said, as we saw earlier, the, the part that has access to the Far East is more civilized, it, even though it's drier, rockier, less agrarian. The citizens of the city-states were united in the search for the good life, but they were subdivided economically and socially in a far more complicated fashion than previously. From this subdivision arose dynamic pressure for internal political development. Or maybe that pressure arose from something else besides economic class. Clash, who knows? Maybe it was economic clash, maybe it was something else. Dynamic pressures for internal political development. Could have been ideas that led to desire for political development. Might, maybe it wasn't class interest, maybe it was ideas. Which eventually led to democracy, or to more conscious oligarchy. So can you see why you would want it to be class interests that eventually led to what he's getting at? Because it leads to democracy. And as we all know, history has moved through the dialectic process. Everything comes about from its stuff before. You know, whatever. I'm so sick of Marx. Everywhere I turn, I can't open a history of the Civil War without Marx. I can't do anything without Marx. The enduring effects of the new political world can hardly be overestimated. Once established, the polis protected accelerated and confined the genius of Greek thinkers and artists like a hothouse. This is an important point uh, that he makes right here, probably the best point of the chapter. And here it gets to the good part. Because the polis, as we understand it, has just been uh, instituted. It's only a century or so old and is just getting going. It's just getting good. And they're spreading the polis far and wide across the Mediterranean. Already by 600 BC, the non-Greek world was beginning to draw heavily upon the ever more attractive Hellenic civilization, which as a result was to be the base of Western culture. Fantastic. Fantastic. Here comes Athens. So, the, the Greek city-states were safe. Thinkers and scientists, philosophers were safe there. Not only that, if they went somewhere else, they were not safe. They were in dire danger. The rest of the world was much more dangerous. Even, even these city-states were, were not too safe. Uh, you know, war, war and crime and stuff. But compared to the rest of, of mankind at the time, and, and I mean, even the civilized areas in the East uh, were, were less civilized, less culturally civilized, more crime and more violation by the state. So the freedoms allowed, freedom of speech and so on in the Greek city-states was like a hothouse. For one reason, it, it just worked really well. Plus then the thinkers couldn't leave these city-states. They had to stay somewhere in the Greek, Greek hegemony. And anybody who wanted to be a thinker had to come to the Greek states, as many of them did. Aristotle was a Macedonian. And we have now a broad understanding of history. We need to understand, I think, colonization a bit more. We're going to look into that a bit 
in Hellenic history, but we have just a couple of notes to make here. And we've just got two paragraphs that I think are interesting fun clarifications. If one compares an archaeological site of the Dark Ages, small d, the ancient Dark Ages, with the ones of the Age of Revolution, so from 1000 to 800, compare that to uh, the age of 750 to 650. The great physical growth in Greek production and the ever more refined artistic quality of its objects are at once visible. Literary evidence also becomes far more abundant as lyric, choral, and other poetry is added to the epic strain. Truly political documents, however, remain rather rare. We have only fragments of the first law codes drawn up by Zaleucus of Italian Locri, Draco of Athens, that's where we get draconian laws, and Cherondas of Catna. Uh, the earliest treaties which have survived come only from the 6th century, the 500s. The date of the first coins is still in dispute. After the Lydian beginnings came coins of the Asia Minor cities and of Agena. The localism of the Greek world is evident in the fact that not all coins were struck on the same standard. In Greece proper, the two most common weights were the Agonetian and the Euboic. The Euboic standard, if you came to be you known. So, we are going to possibly come back to a history of the ancient world, I'm pretty sure. Although we've got enough material that we won't be back to it for a little while, because now we go to the wonderful Hellenic history. Third edition, Botsford and Robinson, 1922, 39, and 50. We are going to skip to chapter 4, page 46. This, this guy's old school. He's hardcore. This is good stuff. Uh, and he has a pretty good treatment of the period we've just gone through in Greece. So we don't need much of what he said there. Some of it would have been nice, but we've already gone through it. We do now have some stuff about the city-state. From the close of the Greek Middle Ages, about 750 BC, the other author puts it at 800, Greek civilization developed with remarkable rapidity. No other Indo-European people, or any Oriental, has achieved results comparable to those of the next centuries in Greece. The one institution more responsible for this extraordinary achievement than any other was the city-state, the polis. Perhaps its most precious contribution to civilization is republican government, which the Greeks devised in endless variety, and which assured to the citizens a varying degree of liberty and self-government. It was under aristocracies, however, that the city-states developed significantly. Throughout the Greek Middle Age, there had been steady pressure against the kingship, and while the details are obscure, nevertheless by the 8th century the nobles had everywhere succeeded in superseding the king. Uh, this they had done either through outright usurpation or by causing the kingship to become an elective office. This guy doesn't have any better explanation than the last guy. The kingship now became an ordinary office, generally priestly or judicial. And remember, a priestly office in Greece isn't a priestly office elsewhere, because priests didn't really have very much um, cultural power compared to other societies. Other offices were created, until at last the city became a complicated organism. During this process, the assembly of citizens lost what significance it had enjoyed, and it became it became less everybody get together and vote on something and more like there's a government and then the citizens go about their, their business. But um, they don't have any better offer for why, why is, does this society reject kings and leaders and rulers? It allowed a ruling class and that ruling class uh, was the first in history to have this dynamic idea of economic gain well, why did it allow that? I don't, I don't think you can explain it too far, except that some men chose to think at some point. I think that's what it is. I don't know. I, I, I'm working on that. I've been working on that for years, and I'm still not there. The most important contribution which they made to the development of the city-state was the codification of law. 